Welcome back, everybody, to the Back Lounge Podcast. My name is Tank. I'm your host, and I'm a roadie with over 15 years of experience in the touring music industry. And in this series, if you're new, we generally just invite people from the music industry, band members, artists, roadies, anybody else, and we just have conversations about whatever comes up. My whole goal here is to have less of an interview with actual stereotypical questions and just have an open conversation about whatever comes up. And our guest for today is Mr. Tom England, best known from Evergrey, also in Redemption and Silent Skies. And I'm super excited about this because I had Tom on my YouTube channel for an interview very early on when I first started. And if I'm being honest with you guys, I was pretty nervous. I was nervous to have somebody of his caliber on, and I wasn't really that comfortable on camera or doing this yet. So the fact that we get to do this again on a longer form podcast is super exciting because we have kind of gotten to know each other and we've kept in contact. So I feel like this is going to be very casual and very open and it's super cool. Now, Evergrey has a brand new album coming out very soon, very shortly after this podcast releases. It's their 13th studio album. It's called A Heartless Portrait, The Orphean Testament, and it's going to release on May 20th, 2022 from Napalm Records. Now, if you're watching this on YouTube, I'll have information in the description of the video where you can still pre-order that record or go pre-save it and find all the places that you can stream and all that. But I'm super excited for this album because we've already gotten a couple singles released There's going to be a third music video. Actually, from the time I'm recording this, I think it was just released, and you can look for a reaction to that on my YouTube channel soon, but I'm really excited for this one. But before we start, I just want to give a quick shout out to the sponsor of today's episode, Rogue Energy. Rogue Energy is a healthy energy and focus supplement created by Overpowered Labs that was originally made as an energy source for gamers as an alternative to sugar-filled energy drinks and sodas. It's got zero calories, and it's loaded with vitamins, antioxidants, and amino acids, and it helps provide not only energy, but superior mental focus with no crash. Now, for those of you that follow the podcast or my YouTube channel or my Twitch streams, you already know well enough, I don't just work with anybody. I don't like to sponsor stuff unless it's something that I actually use and that I believe in. So when Rogue first approached me, I'm not going to lie. I was like, okay, another energy company trying to work with a streamer because I'm used to a lot of these products, man. I've spent a lot of time in the gym. I've tried a lot of these energy powders that just make you feel tingly and crazy and give you a crash. So I told them, you know, if you want to send me some to try out, I will, but no promises. I want to try it first. And I got to admit, I was blown away by this stuff, man. Immediately after taking it, I felt great. I had mental focus and energy. I never got that tingly feeling and I never had a crash from it. No headache, no tired feeling. It was actually very surprising. It's one of the few energy products I've tried that I felt this good from personally. Rogue has tons of different flavors and it's not only limited to just energy. They also have hydration packs, shakes, and even an extreme energy product that is specifically made to use as a pre-workout at the gym. So if you want to give it a try, you can head over to www.rogueenergy.com. That's R-O-G-U-E-E-N-E-R-G-Y.com. Check out all the different products and flavors that they have available. I've tried a bunch of them at this point. My personal favorite is the Grape Popsicle, but they do have a lot of different options for people to check out. And they ship damn near everywhere in the world. And if you find anything you like as an added bonus, you can use the code TANK20, that's T-A-N-K-2-0, while you check out, and you'll get 20% off your entire order from Rogue, regardless of what you order. So once again, you can head over to www.rogueenergy.com today. And thank you to all of the fine people at Rogue for sponsoring this episode. But let's just jump into this conversation, man. Joining us for episode seven of the Back Lounge podcast, Mr. Tom England. Tom, great to see you, man. Welcome back. How are you? I'm awesome. No, I'm good. I'm good, man. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, of course, man. I've actually really been looking forward to this because um, you were you were one of the first interviews I ever did on my YouTube channel when I started. Right. And 
I can admit to you now because I'm comfortable with it. I was, I was so nervous and I wasn't used to doing this. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. And now, and I, I look back at that interview now and it's, I can tell at least for me that there was a little bit of like, not, not that I wasn't comfortable, but I was just, I was nervous doing YouTube stuff still. Sure. So now I'm excited that like a year has gone by. I'm more comfortable with this. We actually kind of know each other a little better because we've talked and stuff like that. So it's to be really cool, man. Yeah, man. I'm glad to be here. It's uh, it's great to have a different kind of conversation. I hope. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll see. I mean, obviously, we've got music and stuff to talk about because you've got, you know, new albums sure. and stuff like that. But, you know, you've you've already had a full day. What have you been up to today? Honestly, I've had a problem with my finger for a good while. Uh that I don't know what it is. So I've been sort of been really worried about the fact that I won't be able to play guitar. So we actually canceled the show even. So now I've been waiting and sort of just resting my hands and hoping, hoping for it to sort of be, get better. Uh, and now I think it's actually the rest is getting, making it worse. <laughs> so, so, so today I started practicing all of our new singles that we will play on, on, on tour in Finland in, in two weeks or it's time, whatever it is. And it actually went pretty well. I haven't tried the solo stuff yet, but uh, all of the other stuff went well. So I'm yeah. quite relieved about that. So, yeah. Yeah, that's, man, that's, I'm sorry you're going through that because I've, as, as a tech on the road, I've seen that like, and I imagine with you, it was probably, do you, do you know how you heard it? Was it just something weird freak accident? No, I don't know what it is. It's either something in the in the actual, you know, like an inflammation, or mm -hmm. or it's like arthritis or something. It's just getting stiffer and stiffer. Huh? Yeah, I've I've toured with guys that um, have like hurt their hands or their fingers because like before shows or on days off they're playing basketball or something, and then like sure, yeah, hyper extend their finger and they're like, oh, I can't play, and that's why you see a lot of artists on the road now, like. Guitar players especially don't do much with their hands on days off. Dude, you take so much for granted too, right? So, I mean, for me, it's like I never even figured I could have a problem with my hands. I mean, I don't have any extra insurance, but I mean, it's my livelihood. It's what I yeah. do. And, you know, so, yeah, now I got this big ass insurance. And, and I, but I mean, I can't go to them now and say I have a problem with my finger. But yeah. I hope for the next time something happens. Uh, I also cut off my thumb, the top of my thumb. <laughs> What? You know, what do you call it? Like uh, slicing potato in this yeah. small uh, razor blade thing? Yeah. <laughs> so I, oh. That Jeez, was also awesome dude. to add on top of this. So, oh, my God. Yeah, life is great. Yeah, well, I mean, you're alive. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's <yeah>. something. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, 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 it's true, though. Like, you, you don't think about injuries and how they're going to affect you overall until they happen. Yes. Um, when the right when the uh, pandemic started and we got sent home from tour, I I started feeling something in my shoulder hurting, and I finally went to a doctor. It was kind of crazy that the pandemic happened when it did because if that didn't happen, we wouldn't have had time off. Right. But I got um you know the MRI and all that on my shoulder, mm. and they're like, oh yeah, you you tore your labrum and your rotator cuff, and you're gonna need surgery, and. After I had the surgery, I didn't realize how much you rely on like the movement in your shoulder. There was yeah. so much stuff I couldn't do for like six months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean yeah. it's ridiculous. Yeah. I couldn't even open like a bottle of whatever. <laughs> I yeah. couldn't even open that. It was like, damn. Yeah, and it's it's crazy too because after a surgery like that, that was my first surgery I've ever had. I didn't know, mm. you know how how much recovery it was going to be. I mean, it was wild. I literally couldn't raise my arm at, at all for like two months. Yeah, was, that sucks. Yeah, yeah, it's a bummer, man. But, you know, especially with, with you guys having live shows coming up, I mean, you know, not just you, but all musicians, you know, need, sure. to, need to be able to play and hands are very important. I actually yeah, it's like you had two years for this damn hand to be to be ill, right? Yeah. And now it's, it's like, what the Yeah, whatever. It yeah. is what it is. Yeah, I, I saw okay. um yeah, I was looking at your guys' touring schedule too, because with um with stuff starting to open up again and you know stuff like that, a lot of bands are going back out. And I was looking at your touring schedule last night and I think there's there's a lot of stuff on the books for you guys, man. I mean, you're all over Europe soon. Yeah. A bit further ahead, which is nice because I still don't trust this pandemic situation. I, yeah, 
I still think uh, you know stuff can happen and but yeah we were smart enough <laughs> for for the first time in our careers we when we postponed this tour we did it for 14 months ahead you know so last, last july or whatever it was we said okay let's move it forward because now of course all the venues are also packed and full for years to come so mm -hmm. they're gonna be like three metal bands per city every night so yeah it's like, which is awesome in, in in one way but you know it's also gonna I mean, people can't afford to go and watch everything, of course. True, true. There, is, <clears throat> Excuse me. I do think there is a sense, though, that people have been so starved for live music for the past two years that they're yeah. going to try. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, you know. and we we're also in the best genre, too, for that to happen. So, yeah, I mean, all the metalheads always support us. So it's awesome. Yeah, I am. Awesome. Um, I, I saw my first concert um, in about two years. Uh, a couple months ago, I went to uh, went to a new venue in Nashville here and saw uh, Ginger actually when they were mm -hmm. touring, and mm, right. it was it was such a good vibe. It was you know the, a lot of the people in the crowd were wearing masks, a lot weren't, but nobody seemed to care. There was no weird political shit going on. It's like everybody in the moment was just like. We're back for live music and had a good time. Yeah. And it was it was great. I mean, same thing there. We have taken that for granted as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now people are just happy to be able to celebrate music and life, right? So yeah. yeah, yeah. And I'm I'm so excited to just see shows, man. And it's it's been it's been weird, um, as as you know, because you're touring and stuff like that all the time too. But for me, being home for two years was was really interesting to adjust to home life. Like my sleep is still terrible. I sleep yeah. way better on tour than I do at home. Um, but I've been planning on seeing shows now. And mm -hmm. I never had that luxury before because I was always on tour. Sure. So. Yeah, that's awesome. That's a good thing about it. But I mean, yeah, I live so far away from the city now. So <laughs> for me, it's still a hassle to go to see a, a show anyway. So, but yeah. What's what's the closest major city for you, Gothenburg? Yeah. Okay. But I live like on the countryside, out by the coast, so there's no like you can't take a bus here. The last bus comes here, it's like four o'clock in the afternoon. So it's oh wow, yeah, you're stuck. Or you, I mean, you can stay at the hotel. I do that often when I go to to Gothenburg. But uh, yeah. Yeah. Did you did you have to do that a lot when you were working on the new album? Because I know you recorded in Gothenburg, or did you just travel back and forth? Actually, for the new album, I, I wasn't there so much in the studio. We, I let Johan and Jonas be there by themselves, and we all did pretty much because they record and, and track themselves, you know. So, uh, and I was here tracking my stuff and doing my guitars and vocals and stuff. So, uh, yeah. I think I don't think I was I can't even remember if I was there at all to be honest, <laughs> which was super weird from going from being a total control freak to it's not like I don't care anymore but now it's like we know that everybody in this band makes their best effort to make it work you know so yeah and we're also saying both me and Jonas at least are super heavily involved in you know the actual production of the album as well so on my end, I have sort of, I keep track on things that are on my end and on the songwriting end. And while Jonas is in the studio, he keeps track of whatever is going on there. So, yeah. So when, uh, when you finish the production on the record and the recording and stuff, I saw that um, this one is also mixed and mastered by Jacob Hansen, which you got to know in that situation, it's going to sound good. And we've heard mm. a couple singles, so we know it does. Do, do any of you guys go to Denmark to be with him when he mixes or do you just trust somebody like that to just mix and send you copies and give your feedback? Yeah, I mean, we, we have done it in different ways. When we started working th with him, it was like five albums ago in 2014. Uh, so we've done a, f done a few albums together. I mean, a lot of albums, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> but so, so we know each other and for the first uh, couple of uh, albums we went there, which is also very nice to get sort of change of scenery and get inspired again because you're obviously very tired of the songs and <laughs> all how they sound and all of that stuff and also being stuck in a studio which some sometimes suck you know so mm -hmm. it's always great okay let's get into the car and let's go to Denmark it's not that far you know it's like six hours away from here or so so um, but for the last couple of albums um, not only because the pandemic but because we have had so much other stuff to do we just 
a mix in uh, he, he mixes start set up a mix we we'll listen a few times and the final touches of the mix me him and Jonas sit in something called audio movers I think which is a uh, you know a live mixing situation where we can sit all the three of us like this pretty much yeah and 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 um, do DBs here and there and add frequencies or cut cut frequencies or you know and I think he's a, you know <laughs> it's not uh, I don't I don't think Evergreen is the easiest band to mix because there's so much information coming out but and uh, and we're also we also know what we're doing me and Jonas you know so it's like we we want a lot <laughs> you know we, we yeah, have yeah. a lot of our uh, yeah so but it's always fantastic results yeah and he's and so uh, what do you call it he has such a great patience with us with that too because sometimes it's hard to also verbally explain what it is that you want you know and of course there's going to be days when we're super tired all of us and it's like come on man what the hell yeah yeah <laughs> it feels like we're re-recording this album but 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 yeah that's that's what we got to do what it takes right yeah it's it's funny because uh Joachim, uh told me when i was talking to him the same thing he's like when we're in the studio sometimes it's hard to verbally explain to the guys like what's in my head what i want it to sound like and the first time i try and explain it it sounds so bad and it isn't until hours later that we actually do it where people are like oh okay like this sure. is what this yeah. is supposed to sound like and it's amazing with technology what you can do now like you were saying just sitting in a call yeah, like yeah. this and working on mixing because we'll i, I want to spend more time talking about the new album but i want to bring this up later you have your hands in so many other projects and stuff that i i don't know how you have the time to do everything but um, I need a pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's you know we've we've seen a lot of stuff. I mean, you know, um, Escape of the Phoenix came out of what February of last year, and yeah, yeah, well, yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah, and then we're getting the new album, um, A Heartless Portrait, uh, in a month from now, May twentieth. And then you've also had a release with Silent Skies as well. So it's, I mean, in a year you've had three studio albums out. I think it's actually more. I think it's like, I think it's both Silent Skies albums. Oh, that's right. Uh, yeah, that was with him. And, and one Redemption album we recorded as well. And uh, I recorded with a guy called uh, Adam from England. He has a band called Devorian. I made an album with him. Uh, and I, I think I did. Now it sounds like bragging, but it, no, it not at all. Not, but but and I think I did like twenty five or thirty uh, guest vocal uh, songs for for fans and uh, and you know our, our listeners, and on top of that, we did, me and Vikram also did four video games. So yeah, man, I mean that's just, I mean, but I mean, I, dude, it's fucking. This is what we love to do. This True. to be able to get to do that and have all of these different influences coming in and all of these opportunities to take part of other people's musicianship or writing methods, all of that, even though it's a 14 year old kid from Australia or somebody who uh, releases their new album, I was on the new Primal Fear album, I, I sing a song. I mean, all of that stuff is equally fantastic for me. It, it's just an honor to be able to step into their worlds and partake in whatever they got going. You know, it's, uh, it's amazing. That, yeah, we're starting to see a lot more of that um, with bands in the U.S. Because the big difference I've always noticed in the music scenes in Europe and the U.S. is in Europe, you do see a lot of that collaboration. A lot of you guys are always working together on different albums. There are band members that are in multiple bands. Sure. In the U.S. music scene, it's very focused on whatever your one project is. I don't know too many of my friends that are musicians that are in multiple bands or multiple projects. But we're now starting to see over this last couple of years, a lot of bands doing collaborations or guest spots on other stuff. And it is mostly metal community. Like you said, you know, you don't usually see a lot of other people doing that. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, I think it's just, as I said, I think it's uh, like a wonderful opportunity to just be, be part of something else. You know, I mean, for when we, when I write from for Evergrey and for Silent Skies uh, in, in particular, it's, I put, I invest all of my heart, all of my feelings, all of my time, all of everything. But I do that in every other project as well. But for, I don't, 
for other people's music, I don't have to write the music. I can just be the vocalist. I don't. Sometimes I don't even have to be the lyricist of a song. I don't have to write the top line melody. Uh, sometimes people just ask me to sing it, which is, you know, it's awesome in different ways. And computer game music is is that what it's called? Yeah, is it called video computer? video game soundtrack. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, I mean, maybe when we're done. I think I mean Evil Dead the game is coming out in a in a in a month or so and Dakar Rally and World War Z and a bunch of stuff. But in that type of music we don't do nothing with the heart. It ain't got nothing to do with the heart, you know. It's only about being a mechanic <laughs> musician, if you will, which is yeah. also awesome because then it, I get that part out of me, just riffing away or you know hammering on the keys, whatever it is. It's it's just. Uh, and when you get to do all of these things, then your main projects like Evergrey, Silent Skies, and Redemption, they get sort of, I, I, I'm sort of, what do you call it? I'm cleansed from everything else, and then yeah. I can put my best into or whatever Evergrey needs in, into Evergrey. Yeah. yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm super excited about um, the new album because, you know... The last album, and you know this, this is funny, like I um, I told you in our last interview, I, my teenage years, my musical taste was formed by a lot of Gothenburg bands. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, I know. But, but for some reason, I didn't discover Evergrey until, you know, I started a reaction channel. And that's, that's what's been sure. cool about this, is I get all these people from all over the world telling me to check out these bands. But I've just fallen in love with the sound and then escape of the phoenix was one of my personal favorite albums of the entire year last year i mean even my wife loves it and my wife doesn't listen to a lot of metal with me <laughs> yeah. yeah that's awesome yeah, that's um, great and this new album we've already got two singles from it and i loved i love the concept with the music videos i didn't know until the second video that it's a, a, a reverse trilogy and when i heard that i was like that's i mean it it's it's a very interesting concept and I don't really think I've seen that. So now I'm excited for the next video because we're getting the story backwards. Was that, right. how, how did that come about? Cause I know you guys are working with Patrick and I mean, the guy's a legend. I mean, we've been working with Patrick for since 2002, we did our first video and we've done like two, two or three videos per album since then. So it's, <laughs> and a live DVD and so, so much great stuff. Uh, so, I mean, and, of course we're friends today too so we yeah the collaboration is patrick is an expert much like jacob pretty much making our dreams come true be it sonically or in an audiovisual way or whatever you want you know it's like they are the guys that bring can, can do that for us the same with janis nakos who makes the cover art for us for the last couple of albums he's also amazing you know so we're lucky to be able to work with all of these great people and and for this um when we switched labels, uh, uh, we had a somewhat better budget to to make videos. Uh, so we, we, but we invested even more money into it because we wanted to do something that we didn't do before. So yeah, so then we came up with this. We knew that Save Us would be the first single, and that Midwinter Calls would be the second single. That was something that the label actually decided. So the actual play with the trilogy has come afterwards but they talk about the same thing in the song mm -hmm. all of these three songs so it was easy for us to make sort of a and just play with it you know and yeah. they, i just watched the new video today oh. uh, the last <laughs> video <laughs> which comes out tomorrow i don't know when we uh, when you air this but uh, it's it's out uh, whatever date 28th of april it comes out so it's probably been out a while when you watch this right? yeah so i i plan on um filming the reaction to that video I try, I try with these podcasts to um, kind of coincide the release of everything. So I'm going to release, yeah. I'm going to do the reaction to the new video, release it. And then this podcast will release the next day. And yeah, perfect. I'm, I'm super excited about it, man. And it's, it's really cool too um, with a lot of your different musical projects, how, uh, how much I've seen my community around YouTube and discord and stuff get into it. I have, um, a lot of friends on our discord server that are very into Evergrey, mm -hmm. but an equal amount of people that are really into silent skies. Right. right. Um, and a lot of those people have different musical backgrounds. Like one of the people on our discord is um, she's a piano teacher 
So the mm-hmm. first time she heard Silent Skies, she was just all about it and just loves it. Sure. And I I love that project for me just because, you know, I've always related music to emotions and feelings as most people yeah. do. And there are times where I want to listen to Evergrey. There are times where I just want to sit and listen to something like Silent Skies. And I think it's, sure. it's, it's a great project. And we had talked before how you and Vikram started doing stuff, but do you have, do you have any plans to do any touring stuff off of that? Or is that kind of just like a project just for the love of doing Dude, that? Yeah, we would love to, uh, we, we have a few offers actually to do stuff, oh, uh, nice. but we want to, it's one of those things we have this sort of world dominance uh, idea in our head now, but I mean, you know, when, when I picture silent skies on stage, I picture a few things that I want to bring in uh, and that takes a lot of effort for us to sort of get going and money as well. So, you know, I, I want to do it right when we do it right the first time. I want to, I, I don't want to do like a small stand in a, it doesn't fit really for, you know, in a bar with drinking beer guys yeah, talking yeah. very loud and, and, and uh, it doesn't work like that. It's, it's meant for some other setting, you know? Yeah. Uh, but I mean, that's the cool thing about Silence Guys for me, if I talk about something totally different for a second. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. that the, it does the same thing for me that Evergrey does. It is just as heavy, just as dark, just as atmospheric, but without the heavy drums and the heavy guitars, you know? So... Yeah, it's. I mean, we ended up on uh, these yearly top lists uh, in many magazines in, in Europe. You know, it was like weird because we didn't expect any of the metal community to sort of think that. I mean, of course, we knew that they could think it was cool, but not that cool. You know, yeah. so that was just yeah, just great. It's just a. I I, I'm so happy that I sort of pursued what I what I did and and that we're here now. We have so much so much stuff coming from silent skies that we already recorded and um we, i think we're gonna see albums every six months from from silent skies damn <laughs> i mean i'm fine with it you know <laughs> yeah everybody's gonna be like damn it's that tom guy again nah. yeah and it's 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 interesting to me just from my perspective of how you guys work that because vikram's obviously based in the u.s right um so when you work on stuff together, I imagine, is it just a lot of sending files back and forth or calls? A lot like of this. this. We actually wrote the, the last time we wrote like this on Zoom. Uh, really? And we also hooked up our stuff on. And and then I work. So I will, I will wake up at 7 o'clock and I do my walks. And then I into the studio and I work for uh, whatever, six hours. And then Vikram wakes up. Then we go through what I've done and... And what I want to do, uh, my total ADHD, <laughs> ah, and he's like, "Oh, so, hold on, I'm just drinking morning coffee." You know? <laughs> ah, I gotta go now. And then I hang up, and then he get to work for like another eight, ten hours, right? So we yeah. get sort of twenty hours out of one single day, which is pretty cool, you know. And we yeah. hear everything. Both of our studios are hooked up, and sound sound is one hundred percent, and you know, it's uh, it was a. But then Vikram flew over here. We did some uh, video game music that we had to get down very fast. Of course, something else happens when you're in the same room together, you know? Yeah. You get more more efficient, more, uh, you know, you can touch somebody on the shoulder and say, listen, <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. So it's, uh, I prefer that, but this is an amazing second best thing. Yeah. For the music videos for Silent Skies, um, you know, I did a reaction to leaving and um, mm. actually did a couple. I did one on Twitch and one on YouTube. And my mm. f- my first gut reaction was, dude, they're an ocean away from each other. They're probably, you know, green screened in here. But you mm. had said that you were together. Did you go over to the U.S. or did he come to you? He came here because Patrick is also here yeah. in Gothenburg, you know. And um, I had bought this uh, grand, big-ass grand piano that was totally unusable, uh, beautiful instrument that we put on fire in the video. Yep. <laughs> um, but it's like 200 years old or something, you know? Oh, wow. So, but it was it was totally unusable. I mean, otherwise we wouldn't have oh, yeah. burnt it. There's... Vikram was even having a heartache. <laughs> oh my God, this is totally against my views and morals and whatever. So, Shut up, let's put it on fire. <laughs> <laughs> even the, the, the piano teacher on her Discord I was telling you about when she saw that video was like, no, like, why are they setting it on fire? 
We've been yeah. seeing a lot of gear destroyed in videos lately, or at least I have from what I've been watching. Um, yeah. The last Sabaton music video, they basically performed up to their chest in water. Water, yeah, right. And I'm I like, I'm like, I, you know, it's it's either instruments that they're fine with trashing or the replicas that their companies made them. And then when I talk to them, they're like, no, those were guitars that our, our guys have used on stage <laughs> for years that were just at the end of their life. And we were like, screw it. And yeah. I was trying to tell everybody that was watching, I was like, you know, a, a lot of the, a lot of music videos that you see nowadays are effects, but something mm. like that, like you're not getting a guitar back from that. That guitar is done. No, it's like, done. Like, and in my, I mean, I am, it probably was done before that. Maybe yeah. the neck was totally, you know, yeah. uh, I, I use the stuff. Uh, yeah. I mean, we put the, <laughs> we put the whole kit on a drum kit on fire too. In, yeah. uh, in the weightless vi video for every gray. Mm -hmm. So, and people thought that was, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, like FX special not, effects, like, no, yeah. Joel was like, "Shit!" Ah, you know, there's fire coming in his face. And... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's awesome. Yeah, let's see what we put on fire next time. Maybe me. Yeah. yeah. Oh man, I mean, that would be awesome. there's 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 special effects and pyro technology that makes that easy. When I um I actually was a pyro technician on tour at one point, and part of our training that we had to do was they have this burn gel for body burns for special effects that we had to um, we had to actually test yeah. where they cover your arm from your elbow down and they light it. And on the skin or on the jacket? No, on your skin. Oh, okay, cool. And this That's what I need. <laughs> yeah, and this gel uh, will protect it. But the crazy thing about that is that any person that does body burns and stuff for special effects for movies, they have to go through training for that because there's something that happens in your mind that when you see yourself on fire, even if you're protected sure. from the gel yeah. and stuff, some people go into shock and freak out, even though they're not having any damage oh. done to them. Yeah. So there are some special effects and stunt people that just can't do it because their mind can't handle it. And I find yeah, that yeah, I get so it. fascinating. Ah, I get it. I get it. I mean, it's yeah. to totally, what do you call it, illogical to have see that on yourself, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I and then I they start putting their hands in their face, you know, and start burning their, you know, eyelids off or whatever. Yeah, and a lot of a lot of those special effects too. I, I found out so much about stuff like that. So I find it impressive that like the guys from Rammstein uh, all have to have pyro certification to do the stuff they do on stage. Um, there are certain um, stunts in movies that when you see, I know I know a little more from what I've been trained on now. And when you see somebody in a movie or a music video that's doing like a full body burn where they're like running on fire or something like that, mm. they actually have to hold their breath the entire time that they're doing that because if they start inhaling those flames, it'll too much will collapse your lungs. <laughs> like Shit. there's so much that goes into it that's crazy to me, man. When I see that stuff, I'm just like, it's nuts. Yeah, that sounds insane. So make I mean, make sure. of course, you need your training. <laughs> yeah. So make sure you get proper training if you ever decide to light yourself on fire for a music video. <laughs> I'm crazy like that. I'd, I'd do anything. If somebody tells me, yeah, it's fine. We stand next to you with a, you know, extinguisher. Yeah. So, okay, let's do it. You know, I don't, it's like, I don't care. Yeah. I mean, we, we see bands that do that. I've seen live bands that they think it's funny when they have pyro going off that they'll like run up and headbang through the flame or something because it's just a quick burst and i'm just like <laughs> yeah you know, it's can you have pyro in the us now is, the, is it allowed uh it depends uh club venues no definitely not uh ar arenas yes uh festivals yes um every time i've done pyro was in an arena but you're always at the kind of scrutiny of the fire marshal at the show yeah okay because if it. if they approve it their name is attached to it. So if a fire marshal approves me doing pyro for a show and I light the building on fire, they're, yeah. they're going down just as hard as I am. Yeah, so I a lot of fire marshal, I've had fire marshals that even though I give them a proper demo and I show them all the safety precautions, they're just not comfortable. So I've, I've definitely had shows on tours when I did pyro where even though we did pyro on every other show, there was just a fire marshal that was like, I'm not cool with it. And we just shut it down for the night sure so yeah, yeah yeah i mean stuff happened yeah i mean i mean that's the thing accidents 
accidents do happen and i mean a lot of the time it is human error and stuff like that but there's never a guarantee that everything's going to be perfect i mean i've had a, f a liquid flame unit on a tour malfunction in the middle of a show nothing i did it just broke and sprayed the liquid the flammable liquid solution all over the back of the stage and just created a huge fire and in that moment all i can do is just immediately go into you know the mode of how do i handle this and it's like okay shut down the unit shut off the propellant and then fire extinguish it and that's it you know mm -hmm. and yeah. i've always i've always been told by the person that trained me a good pyrotechnician knows when to not press the button so mm -hmm. You know, if you see your artist on stage, we've seen with Metallica, you know, like if your artist is too close to a flame head when they shouldn't be, you need to know not to hit that. Key. Yeah, you can't sit there and eat burger and just. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Fire! <laughs> <laughs> and unfortunately, there are some pyro guys that are like that, that are just like, fire, fire, go like, you know. <laughs> sure. So, but it's, uh -oh. it is fire and special effects have become such a common thing with arena and festival shows everywhere now that it's it's almost more shocking when i go see a headlining band in an arena or a festival that doesn't have pyro or some kind of special effect yeah yeah so yeah gotta invent some new stuff yeah i mean you're starting to see you know uh you know cryo it's co2 gas has always been a popular one because it's a cool sure. visual effect um, you know, lasers are starting to become super popular with a lot of bands again and stuff like that. But yeah, we're, we're just going to have to wait and see when the next big live entertainment special effect thing comes out because, you know, with technology going the way it's going, we're probably going to see some crazy stuff soon. Yeah. 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 But I mean, as you said, I think it's, you know, it's, there's an inflation in the fire usage on stage now. It's like, it's not, you know. Like you said, you expect it rather than mm -hmm. get surprised by it. Then, then sort of, then the effect of it is pretty much gone. To, yeah, you know, when it was not like when you saw it for the first time, when somebody sort of had these big ass bombs underneath the stage, so the whole thing shook, and you know, yeah, it, it's. You make a good point. I actually, while it's still cool to see Pyro at a show, I think people have become a little desensitized to like just the normal you know, propane flame units and stuff like that. Like it's mm. starting to become, you know, that's why people like, again, the Rammstein shows is because they it's use insane. very unorthodox things. In their yeah, they use so much more stuff and they do it so delicately in a sense too. And they have this black smoke and, you know, it's uh, their latest tour is, I mean, that, that's the last show I saw before the pandemic. Oh, no way. Yeah uh so dude if you get a chance just go and watch it it's insane i think the last time i saw them live was actually about 20 years ago yeah and that's when they put themselves on fire that's how yeah. they came out right so yeah right the that's tour cool. the tour i saw was um you know they they took off in the u.s in the late 90s when duhast came out and then the next album after that I saw that tour and even then I was just blown away by some of the special effects that they use and some of the stuff that they were doing. And then you look at what they're doing now and it's just ridiculous. And, yeah. uh, you know, a band like Sabaton too, like I, you know, they, they use a lot of standard pyrotechnics, but the way that they do it is cool. Like, you know, with, with Hannes sitting on the tank and there's liquid flame units shooting out of the tank while he's playing, like it's, it's yeah. wild. I told him, I told him that he, years ago because in the beginning they just had that tank standing there and i said why you should be shooting stuff you know <laughs> with the tank whatever mount something up on a wall and shoot it down like yeah. pink floyd did with the aeroplane you know coming yeah from the, so awesome yeah and they do yeah. i mean what it was i can't remember i think it was um night witches or something when they do that live like Yo Kim pulls out a big bazooka and literally aims it at Hannes and they have an explosion yeah. go off. Like yeah, I actually saw that, that tour, yeah. Yeah, I cannot wait to see that band, man. They're going to be in Nashville um in October. Um right. and I'm hey, super right. I'm super excited. Their their European tour that was supposed to be going on before the one they're on now cuz they're touring Sweden. Um 
they're headlining European tour. I was actually planning on flying over there and, and seeing some of those shows and then got canceled and all that. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious to see what they do here because at least in Nashville, they're playing a very interesting venue. They're playing the Ryman Auditorium, which is where the original Grand Old Opry was. It's known as the mother church of country music. And I'm like, this is going to be wild to see Sabaton play in the same place where like, I mean, you know, like Dolly Parton and Garth Brooks and stuff are all playing. <laughs> yeah. So. I think they may, may make it work for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be great. It's uh, them and Epica. So that'll be, okay. a, that'll be a great show. Um, and then later this year, I'm actually going back out on tour, which that'll be fun too. Wow. With yeah. who? Um, Electric Callboy, when they come to the U.S., they asked if I would just come Guitar Tech because it's their first headlining tour in the U.S. They haven't been here in like 10 years, and they were like, I mean, it kind of makes sense. We already know you from your reactions. We know you're a Guitar Tech. Do you just want to come out because we wanted an American with us? And I was like, yeah, sure, why not? It's only four weeks. Wow, so, that's awesome. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited to actually work on gear. Like, I miss that. <laughs> yeah, I get it. Of course you do. I mean, it's like... Yeah. I don't even know who I am anymore, not touring. It's like, I've been doing it for such a long time. It's like, now when I get up on stage, it's like, do I know how to do this still? But of course, after a song or two, you're in it again, right? Mm -hmm. So now I can't wait to get back to North America and South yeah. America and all Americas, you know? It's yeah, like, I mean, it's, it, again, like you had said earlier, people have been so starved for music. I just cannot wait and there's so many tours going on right now but unfortunately nobody's really hitting nashville anymore like, nobody's Why? doing shows here it, i never it, even been to nashville actually yeah it, it, the the music is or the the town is so oversaturated with music already there's a hundred stages on broadway like downtown yeah. with yeah. music all the time so even the big country bands don't even do a lot of shows here because people are so desensitized to live music that the tickets don't sell well. The crowds are usually really flat. So yeah, nobody's, yeah. nobody's really doing shows here. People rather go to free shows or, or and yeah. drink beer, right? Yeah, I guess yeah. that's it. Yeah. I mean, uh, the, la the last like metal sh other than Ginger, like the last metal show that I saw in Nashville. Well, I, I did see Slayer on their farewell tour. Mm -hmm. um, How was that? Oh, it was fantastic. Actually, my favorite band of the night was Behemoth. <laughs> I, I, they're awesome i mean man. dude i first saw them in 2005 they were mm. an opener on a tour i saw i had no idea who they were at the time and uh this this lineup was behemoth lamb of god and slayer and i personally thought behemoth had the best show yeah i, yeah, I would think so i mean without saying anything bad about slayer but i saw slayer so many times you know mm -hmm. it's like I mean, so on every festival you're at, you see Slayer, right? Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, but it's great. I mean, when I saw Behemoth first time it was uh, in Slovenia somewhere in in Europe, and there was this thunderstorm, making the PA, PA wings, you know, go back and forth like this, and they were oh. playing us. It was like hell on stage, <laughs> but they had to quit, which sucked because I thought it would be awesome and like lightning struck or something, you know, because yeah. then. <laughs> then I would have believed he was Satan, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, they. I remember the first time I ever saw them, I think they were opening for Chimera, and mm -hmm. they walked on stage. And, you know, black the black metal scene is a very underground thing in the U.S. still. And back then, you know, they walk on stage. They're wearing gauntlets and corpse paint and stuff. And I'm like, to me being just the old school metalhead, I'm like, who are these guys? And then they started playing and I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. And they mean business. They can play too. Yeah. Dude. Fantastic musicians. Um, and then Polish guys, some, so many Polish bands that fucking, yeah, I don't know how, I don't know how to do it to be honest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then, and, uh, before that, the only other metal show I've really seen in Nashville was, um, at like a 400 capacity club, I went and saw a Carcass. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was like Way back or... uh, like okay. ten, 10 years ago. Yeah. I it listened was... to that one. Where they, where was that song called? Corporal Jig Short Quandary. I remember that. I will never <laughs> yes. remember that. And then they had this great album called Heartworks too, right? Oh, so good. So good. The guitar work on that album. Mm-hmm. 
Mike Hamilton. Yeah, that was g great. Yep, that was when Mike uh, was still in the band. And then I can't remember what album it was from, but I, I, there's, they have a song called "Keep on Rotten in the Free World" that was like one of my favorite Carcass <laughs> go tos. <laughs> And I, at my age, at my age now, I stay out of mosh pits for the most part. I like to just stand near front of house and listen and take everything in. But what, when that song came on, I looked at my buddy and I just ripped off my coat and I was like, I'm going for it. <laughs> Hold my beer. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was just so fun, man. Um, and that's, you know, I just, I, I just love the atmosphere of live music and I'm just so excited to have it back. And you know, you, like you said, we never know what's going to happen. There could very well be another wave of this where it shuts everything down again. But um, I mean, let's uh, let's stay positive now. Yeah, for sure. I mean, people are. I mean, I mean, we culture is such a important aspect of life, and that has sort of become extremely evident for me now during these times that I've been sort of, yeah, you know, like you said, you're, we've been starving for. I mean, that's why like Netflix went through the roof and now they went through the floor yeah <laughs> because but uh yeah because people need culture right mm -hmm. it's 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 uh, unexplainable but we we really need it to just as uh, just as breathing right so yeah i mean it's the the culture the identity the belonging to something like exactly especially yeah. that the belongings I mean, just being there, rubbing up against each other, and you know, people smelling bad and beer and sticking to the floor. Yeah. With, you know, <laughs> you know, it's all of that stuff. Yeah. I miss all of that stuff that I sort of didn't really love <laughs> before, but now it's like, give me all of that. Yeah, care. yeah. It's like I yeah. almost miss the smell of the, just the the rotten beer stained club. You know, <laughs> Going exactly. To to music. <laughs> you know, this sour stench <laughs> when you walk into a venue in the morning. Ugh yeah yep well and that's that's give that's, me that. <laughs> that that's what i'm excited about going back out on tour because you know Elec electric cowboy has been blowing up in the last couple of years and in europe right now they're playing very big venues but when they come to the states it's all over the place there are some venues that are like 2000 capacity and then there's a couple that are like 300 and sure. those are clubs that i've been to in my years of touring that i'm just like Man, it's actually going to be really cool coming back to this small dive bar. Sure. I mean, what? Yeah. I mean, whatever. Right now, I'll play a toilet. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Join me in the toilet. It's like two tickets. Uh, Hopefully, we sell out. Yeah. I mean, it's it, it's going to be great when everybody gets back out. You know, I think it's almost in a weird way. It's going to be like a, a a breath of fresh air. It's going to be like we're back to what's normal. You know. Yeah, and at the same time, I think we're also in a place where there's a new normal now, right? We're gonna find out what that is, mm -hmm. and uh, and I am. I think there will be so much stuff coming, so much great music, movies, uh, whatever. If you love theaters, but all of this culture stuff that I was just talking about, there's gonna be so much great stuff coming out. I think we're gonna find, you know, geniuses and masters now during these couple of years because people mm -hmm. have had time to express their art in the most refined way because they were sort of forced to be in their homes right or we were forced to be in our homes so for me that was the actual for me it wasn't like a hard task to do all of these albums we were talking about in this amount of time it was no, this is what happens if you get allowed to do it and have the sort of fundings. And I'm very lucky to have that, you know, and, and survive from your art. I mean, it's it's amazing. Yeah. That's all I want, right? But yeah. I would love to have more time, like one a year per album, writing it and releasing it, and then you go on tour. And then you do that every other year. That would be awesome. But now it's like everything at the same time and everybody's hysterical and need interviews and press and master stuff and video recordings and all and so then it becomes chaotic and yeah. then your art suffers at least for me yeah it and you brought up a really interesting point of uh this last couple of years we're starting to see like you know really masterful people that we never really knew before and for me aside from the content i do on youtube i've d i've found so many musicians online that 
I, I just never known about and they blow my mind. Like I tell people all the time, whenever somebody tells me so-and-so like name any musician is the best musician in the world. I was like, there's no chance. The best musicians in the world are probably people that you and I have never heard of yeah. that have just through circumstance have never had the exposure to get their art and their craft out to people. But we're we not even interested in getting there. Exactly. Art. People that don't even care about signing a record. I don't deal care. I'm doing it. music only for me and my own, you know, I mean, and that's pretty much, I think at the same time, I think that's pretty much what all of us musicians do. We do, we make music for, for the love of making music. Mm -hmm. And then we have had all of this business sides added on top of things because, you know, we, we need to eat. Right. But yeah, yeah, I get what you mean. Absolutely. Yeah. And a lot of, a lot of musicians have also turned to, um, streaming on Twitch and stuff now, like. I had such a fascinating conversation with both Vicky from the agonist and Grant from unleash the archers because they both regularly stream on Twitch now. Mm. And I asked like, as a, as a musician, what has that done for you? And they're like, it's changed everything because before, you know, a lot of people have the misconception that any band that gets signed is just financially set and they can get whatever they want. And it's not true. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, like, we can laugh about that. Cause we know, <laughs> But Vicky and Grant said that when they were home from tour before, they're like, yeah, we'd come home from tour with a little bit of money, but we'd have to work jobs. And now through the pandemic, we've been able to get on Twitch and continue doing our music. Grant plays guitar all the time. Vicky tracks vocal stuff. And there are people that watch and people that support. And they both said it's allowed us to focus more time into our actual love of our music rather than having to come home and then go work another job just to survive you know yeah yeah, yeah so. exactly yeah that, i mean i'm not on twitch i mean i'm i'm sort of biased what do you call it i'm i have a so it's a paradox for me because yeah. i really want to do it but as i just said then i also know that I could be spending my time writing music instead, but yeah. maybe that's what they do online. Is it? Yeah. 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 There's, there's times where they'll just do whatever, like they'll just sit and chat with people if they want. But yeah. I've watched, I've watched Vicky stream and record like actual vocal tracks that she's using on a release. So it's like combining her just sitting at her house, writing music, but letting all of her fans watch it and support it while she does it. And I was like, that's mm. a, fantastic utilization for musician of something uh matt from trivium does the same thing every yeah. time he's yeah. writing new stuff he just streams and lets people watch it that's awesome yeah it's a it's 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 very time consuming um there's a lot that goes into twitch and live streaming and stuff but some of the artists that have figured it out man i mean anytime matt streams um and he does it on tour too he'll be in his tour bus just you know, doing yeah. vocal tracks. Yeah. There's like a thousand people watching. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fuck. It's wild. So, dude, I, I, <laughs> I don't know if I could do that even. I think I suck too much. You know, <laughs> the <laughs> stuff, the stuff you hear on albums, it's so, you know, worked through. <laughs> what do you call it? It's so refined when it's yeah. like end up on an album. It's like. People are going to think, dude, this dude sucks. I can also do that if I need 100,000 hours, you know. But, like... <laughs> but to me, to me, that's the great thing about Twitch. In in YouTube, we in YouTube all the time when you see uh, musicians that do cover videos and guitar tracks and stuff, it's a very perfected product. They yeah. They edit it, they get a perfect mix, then they record over it like a music video. Sure. The cool thing about Twitch is that you do get to see musicians being human and messing up and going back to Vicky she's said before that she's gotten positive feedback from fans that may be aspiring singers that are like it's it's almost good for my confidence to see somebody like you actually make an error it shows me mm. that you don't have to be perfect at all times to, sure. to be able to do this so I actually think that's kind of one of the cool things about Twitter. it is I mean uh, yeah absolutely I think it's an awesome way to sort of inspire people and get them fired up, you know, for, yeah. for becoming whatever they want to become. But yeah, I don't think it's for everyone. <laughs> I, was, oh. I would be like, oh, damn. I, for, I would be sort of forgetting that they were there, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
all kind of shit could happen. <laughs> oh, dude, I've made so many mistakes on Twitch it, where I've had to like delete the video afterwards. Um, one one time when I had, um, I was doing something and I was sharing my screen and I accidentally opened a tab that had like my home address, my mailing address on it. Oh, and one of my moderators was like, uh, it was only up there for a second, but you just had your home address on the screen. And I was like, all right, well, I'll just delete that video when I'm done, you know. And I did the same thing. I put up a screenshot of something from my computer, and that was like all my banking stuff, and my, <laughs> you know, it was every. And and Hannes was the one guy calling me, dude, take that off. <laughs> it, it says everything about you. It's like, yeah, uh, maybe that's why I don't have any money. <laughs> uh, probably. <laughs> yeah, I was I was giving Hannes a hard time when he did the first episode of this podcast. Mm -hmm. And it was so funny because, you know, he's sitting in the little home studio that him and Floor have, and his audio was like, it was it was good, but it's like right next to his head is like this four thousand dollar microphone that Floor uses on all of her videos, and I'm like, dude, you have this like, what high... this? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, dude, you have this. You have this immaculate mic right next to your head and you're not even using it. And he's like, no, oh, yeah. whatever. <laughs> I'm a drummer, man. I yeah, don't yeah. He was, he's so funny, man. And you know, I, he obviously, one of the things he said, I think you'll find this funny or you probably already know, uh, <laughs> okay. you know, I, I asked him about playing in Evergrey and he was like, yeah, before I was, he, he was talking about how he lives under a rock with music, especially in Sweden. He goes, before I joined Evergrey, I, I didn't know. I didn't even know who the band was. <laughs> I was like, no, he didn't. He didn't have a clue. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah, he's funny. I mean, he's uh, one of my best friends. It's yeah. like, it's just great that he sort of went and did that. At that time, I was also in a period of Evergrey where I didn't want to continue with Evergrey. So when he got the chance, I was yeah, fuck, it. go. I'm going to yeah. quit this stuff anyway, you know? So yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. But, but now, uh, we never see each other anymore, but uh, <laughs> which sucks. But uh, we, we, we plan it <laughs> a lot. And then it's like, no, it's either a kid is sick or, you know, somebody else is, you know, doing something. So yep. it's... Oh, dude, I, I, I understand that so much now because I admittedly, and I told my wife this, like, I'm a pretty selfish person in the fact of I, I've always liked to be able to do whatever I want, like when I want to. Dude, a kid will completely wipe that out. <laughs> like, forget about it. <laughs> oh, my schedule runs on our daughter now, and that's it. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So. But uh, yeah, welcome to the club, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's wild because she just turned one, and she's—you can tell she wants to talk so bad and communicate with us, but can't. Yeah. And she yeah. gets frustrated. <laughs> yeah. Um, sure. Imagine yourself. Oh, yeah. I mean, when I had uh, Joachim on here, we had a moment where we both had to stop and start laughing because she came up to my door here and just started pounding on the door and yelling because she wanted in here. You know, Let me cool. in. Yeah. And it happens on videos all the time. There's many YouTube videos I have where you can just hear her on the other side of the door just yelling. Yeah, that's awesome. That's part of life. It's, it's awesome. It's, it's great. I wouldn't have it any other way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so one, one thing that you said before we started filming that I, I would love to talk to you about because, you know, everybody knows we're into gear. Um, you're very known for using comparison guitars, but you said you are getting a signature model soon. I want to know about that. I, I want to know all about it. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, I've been with comparison for so many years now. It's like 25 years, I think, next year. Uh, I was with Ibanez before, and, mm -hmm. and then Matthias... Uh, uh, Eklund got me into comparison when I wanted to switch. So, uh, yeah, so I was with them when they were with their old, old ownership and all of that stuff. So, and back at that, those days, they built all kinds of guitars for us. If I could turn the computer now, I can't because it's hooked up to the sound. You yeah. will see all of these guitars that I have here. But, uh, oh, here's one. Here's one, on, here's one they built. This one says, you can't hear this on the radio or we, <laughs> when you yeah. put it on the uh, but yeah, this is one of the sort of signature models that they did build for me, but they were, they were never put in a store, right? Yeah. Uh, but now now we're going to do that. So uh, that's what we're working on right now uh, in the midst of uh, 
10 hour interviews per day so i would like to spend so much time on this right now so it's uh, but uh, yeah i'm super excited to get to do it uh, because i love the guitars and i will base them on a model that is there and then i will add my stuff because i love the guitars i love the sound i love how they feel that's that's why i play them right so i don't want to change too much stuff i want to just do the stuff that I have done on, on on my on my other guitars. Take away the tone control, for instance, is one of the things. Move the volume a little bit, but maybe I don't. Want, I can't talk too too much about it right now. Yeah. But there there are stuff that I'm gonna change to make it mine. But at the same time, I don't want to make it super personal because I want to have other people feel like it's theirs, right? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna add some small stuff. What's but, uh? uh what kind of body style are you going to go after? Like a Dellinger or a Horus? Probably the... I, I'll bring it, okay? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, probably this maple neck Dellinger. I'm thinking of doing a maple neck too because I've... I, I've it, it's such a... There's something with the maple neck. And I don't know what it is. I can't figure it out. There's something with it that I enjoy more, and, and it's snappier, it's brighter, it's a, uh, uh, and it sort of fits my ear better in a sense, right? So this is prob probably <laughs> the model that I'm gonna base it on, but uh, with the with this these modifications that I that, that I will add. Uh, nice. But I'm not there yet. Yeah. I'm uh, figuring it out in my head. Uh, would be awesome if we had it finished for next year i think sometime yeah and this is and this is definitely one that they're gonna like have for sale on the market too right like yes that's, that's so cool man and that's why i want to also, also keep the price down because they are very pricey but mm -hmm. that's what you you have to that's what you get that's what you have to pay for getting a great guitar unfortunately Absolutely. that's it so if i would start taking away stuff stuff like the floyd and put on a cheaper Floyd or whatever, you know, um, th then that would have this, there's a shallower on this, for instance, I mean, if I would change that for something different, then it would be, wouldn't be like a guitar that I played anymore, you know? Yeah. I want it to be exactly like the one I play, but I yeah. would love for it to cost 1500 euro uh, dollars but uh, but but it's impossible right yeah and i mean anybody that's getting into a comparison kind of already knows that i mean comparison isn't one of those brands like your ibanez or fender or gibson that has mid to low level stuff they're all custom guitars that are made with high-end parts yeah yeah um, you know. and made all of them you know it's like yeah <laughs> that's what you have to pay yeah. and you know today given given all the these logistic problems that you know the whole world seen all, all all detail yeah and people are into it man like um dean lamb from archspire he is a uh endorsed artist of kiesel guitars and mm -hmm. they, they just built him a signature model. It's the exact specs of the one that he they originally made it for him for stage and then they decided to sell it and i was very curious to see i was like i wonder how this is gonna sell because this is a, a very specific model it's like i believe it's a seven string it might be an eight i think it's a seven mm -hmm. um but it was like i, I think it was like 23 or 2400 dollars, and those things sold out on pre-orders yeah and i was like i mean there's a market for you know guitar players that want good signature models Sure, and I mean, the, the thing with me is also, I'm not this, you know, virtuous playing quick and uh, yeah. flashy stuff. I, I'm, for me, guitar playing is a tool to make great songs. Yeah. Uh, for me, uh, I need a great instrument to, to help me when I'm inspired to, and that's exactly what the comparison does for me. It's like, I know that I will get the sound from it that I expect and at the same time I've been doing it for 25 years with them I it's in my ears I mean it that is my sound I can't I can touch other guitars and feel that they feel awesome and sound amazing but they don't sound like me you know so yeah. and the, you can you yeah. can hear that through your playing though I mean you can hear there's a difference in guitar players how we're saying like um you know Dean from Archspire because we were talking to him the dude can shred at like 320 BPMs. Sure. But he's in a technical death metal band. That's what they do. 
Um, with your playing, when I hear solos and I hear the leads, you hear the translation of the emotion into that. It's almost the guitar has become an expression of your creativity and your feelings and stuff. And you can hear that. And that's what I like about different guitar players. You know, that's awesome because that's exactly how I view it. For me, it's like I go from singing with my voice to singing with my guitar. That's what I, that's my sort of perspective of, of gu yeah. guitar soloing. My favorite guitar player, I would say, is Adrian Smith, right? Yeah. Because I can sing all of his solos. I can sing them, right? Mm -hmm. Because he's such a master at composing solos with melody. And, and melody for me is key, you know? It's everything. Then I love Ingve Malmsteen. I love Richie Kotzen. I love uh, Paul Gilbert, uh, John Petrucci, and all of these fantastic players. Uh, and I wish I could play like them, yeah. but I can't. But I can play fast, and I can I can do all of that stuff too. But I'm more concentrated on making a solo like yeah. that. That sounds like my voice, you know. I yeah. don't know if that makes sense. Even. No, uh, being able to, like you said, being able to sing a vocal melody over a solo you're hearing, like that is a sign to me of like the actual feel. And that's not to say that some of these guys that are shredding their faces off don't have feel, but No, hell no. That's not at all what I mean. Yeah, yeah. My my everybody says singing my mom's thing can't play with feeling. <laughs> Shut yeah. up. You know, Shut up. I will I will say I've I've been unfair to John Petrucci at times because I I started listening to Dream Theater in the early two thousands. Um right. And I think every guitar player musician knows what John Petrucci is capable of. Yeah. But there became a point in time for me where I just, I don't know, man, for some reason I'm like, man, I understand that you can shred so much better than everybody else, but I, like, I don't need that all the time. Like, like I said, I want something like, you know, a solo from you that has that melody and that feel. And it's not to say that John doesn't have feel at all. No, it's dude, just, he does, dude. I mean, that's that's what yeah. I loved about his playing. Yeah. First and foremost, his sense of harmony, his sense of, mm -hmm. again, same thing as with Adrian Smith. He's just pure knowledge of making it sound great with four notes instead of 44. You know, it's like, yeah. that's it for me. That's where he gets me from the first note. Yeah. I mean, all of it, and his wow stuff, it's amazing, too. I mean, yeah. dude, he's... Uh, I think for me at times, it's just, I, I think I've progressed past a point where I listen to my metal where I would rather feel the solo than get over the top technical shredding. And that's just my personal taste, you know? Yeah, and um, I think pretty much, yeah, I'm the same. I mean, I, I, I love Dimebag and it's not, I mean, he plays stuff that is so technical but you don't hear it's technical in a sense right yeah it sounds like a decently easy thing to play but when you get down to it of course it's extremely yeah. difficult but that's i think that's also the thing you know you you need to make it comprehensible for people yeah and for yourself you know it needs to be yeah that's why i love it when it's singable i mean it's adrian smith uh, 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 in terms of soloing, but then it's also David Gilmour for, for, from Pink Floyd for, for me, you know, it's like, and the first guy I got into was uh, Mark Knopfler from Die Straits, you know, so all these guys, they had this amazing capability of playing melody, you know, and that, of course, that just stuck m with me, and c of course, coming from Sweden, also having ABBA and all of that stuff, yeah. in, 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 you know, in our upbringing, that, that has, of course, colored our way of thinking about music I think. yeah the way i grew up was was interesting because while i i i'm i'm a metalhead like through and through but i like a lot of other kinds of music and i grew up on the classic rock that my my dad listened to when he was younger so a lot of the guitars guitarists that i remember hearing um as a kid one of the big ones richie blackmore i mean sure you know, Deep Purple, my, my dad, my real name is Ian and my dad named me after Ian Gillen and Ian Anderson, or sorry, Ian That's Pace, awesome. Ian Anderson's yeah, yeah. Jethro Tull. Um, the flute so, guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and which by the way, <laughs> because we just brought up Ian Anderson, I saw an interview with him recently where he said that every musician that has a tech is a diva. 
<laughs> I guess he's right. <laughs> he's like, he said, "Where's he, my guitar butler?" As Henry used to say, <laughs> he was. I I didn't agree with the argument, but I kind of got where he was coming from. But he was like. Yeah, yeah. He goes, I don't have techs because I think it's the most soulless thing for a, a musician to hire somebody to take care of their instrument. And I was like, yeah, but like, there's a reason you need to hire somebody to do that. For example, you just said 10 hours of interviews and media bands do that when they're on tour. Yeah. Like they don't have the time to give the attention to all of their gear. So they need people to help with that. You know, there's, yeah. there's so much more oh, that artists I mean do on the road. Absolutely. I mean, to not have somebody, I mean, to sort of break down your own gear after show, then I wouldn't do this anymore. It's like, yeah, it's, it's honestly, it's like, it's and, that, and that, that might sound like a diva, but it, then it's like, um, I want to play music. I don't want to, <laughs> that's what I want to do only. Yeah, yeah there's, yeah. I've, I'm a diva. That's it. I got it. <laughs> I Listen, man, I have worked for musicians that, and, and the funny thing is, the way that that quote came off, he's trying to say that like these musicians don't know how to work on their stuff. All of these guitar players know how to restring and work on their own gear. Sure, I worked in a music shop for ten years. Yeah, but restringing guitars, but, I know that part. <laughs> but they're like you said, there's 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 so much that goes on that people don't see on tour. Like people that go to concerts, they they see all the opening bands, they see the band that they went to see, and 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 that's what they see. They don't see the nonstop media that that artist had to do all day, whether it was an interview on site or phoners with radio stations and stuff like that. There might be writing that they're doing on the side. There might be radio appearances they need to do. There's, I mean, I've done tours with artists who I literally don't see from the time I wake up until the show sure. because their whole day is media. Yeah. You know, so. I mean, yeah, it's, it's a, it's, I mean, it's, it's a luxury for sure. Uh, when you can afford to have uh, techs, absolutely. But it's also something that m will make your show better, right? Yeah. It's yeah. something that will sort of ensure that stuff works, and and that's what people pay for. You know, they come to watch somebody play their music, and if you know you have a bad guitar or no strings, and you have to stand and wait and watch for twenty minutes because the guitar player can't restring his guitar, then I'd rather have a tech yes yeah yes. and it's my last tour that i did i worked for two very different guitar players um one of the guys was the actual country artist like his name on the marquee and he played mostly acoustic but played electric at times and then i also teched for his lead guitar player now the lead guitar player was so into his gear this guy knows more about gear than anybody i've ever met i learned so much from him he's the kind of person that in the middle of a show would come back to his talkback mic and be like, "Hey Tank, can you can you bump the mid like ten percent on my amp on my basement amp? Like, just that's it." And like he hears all that stuff. Um, he is very touchy with his guitar. He'd come over in the middle of the show and grab like an Allen key and just raise one of the saddles on one of his strings because it just didn't feel right. And I loved that because I learned so much about um preferences and feel of all these different players but then the main artist that i was teching for he didn't give a shit like i'd be like hey i want to change your pickup out on this acoustic are you cool with that and he's like do you think it's going to sound better i was like yeah and he's like then go for it i don't care <laughs> like he doesn't care as long as it played and worked i could do whatever i wanted to any of his stuff i'm i'm pretty much like that yeah as long as you don't fuck with the you know height of the strings or whatever. yeah yeah but uh, other than that, it's like, as I said before, the, the, the guitars and, and all that stuff that we bring on stage is it's tools for me to perform the song. And uh, but Henrik, on the other hand, is like he can sit and talk for days about guitars. And yeah. and I love guitars, too. That's not it. But, you know, we have a total different view on guitar playing, which is cool. That makes us also a great duo in a band. For, yeah. You know, we have these different styles and different interest in gear and and uh, and I mean, uh, yeah of course he knows more stuff more about stuff than i do but yeah maybe i know more about the recording stuff than he does so it's yeah. like it's a it's the balance of things that makes it work in this band i guess that's what does make a great band is when everybody brings something to the table that can complement everybody else you know yeah, yeah. and um, now i'm asking him you know for ideas for the signature model because i'm so you know it's like 
I don't know what to do. I mean, I can just change the color. That would suck. You yeah. know, it's like, here's a yellow guitar. It's mine. It would suck. Yeah, I follow so, yeah. I, I follow him on social media and I just love it because I, I mean, he he posts pictures of guitars like they're his children. It's just it's so amazing. <laughs> and then yeah. and then another uh, Swedish band, it, a funny compliment is uh, Orbit Culture. Nicholas and Richard are like that. It's like Nicholas is so super into all the technical specs on his guitar and like taking care of it. And he always jokes like he said a million times, like he's like, Richard doesn't give a shit. <laughs> like, just give him a guitar yeah, and yeah, he just yeah. goes, you know? Yeah, yeah. So. I, but I, I love, the, the only thing I'm sort of, it needs to work. That's it. If it, if mm -hmm. it I mean, that's why I was playing PV amps before, you know? It always worked. 5150 yeah. always worked. Yeah. No matter what room you had, it always worked. It always sounded, you know, 80, 90% of what you expected, you know? Every time. And the same with my Bogner now that Reinhold built, you know? It's like, amazing sounds amazing everywhere but it's too expensive to you know throw around for a you know 300 club tour yeah <laughs> like, so when you go back out on tour are you are you usually still using like tube amps and stuff on the road or have you guys started yeah. going digital no we haven't uh but i mean now i work with neural as well you know and it mm -hmm. sounds amazing to me now I haven't checked out the Petrucci stuff, but it, people says it's like ridiculous. So, yeah. But when that starts to, when you can do that and put it, and so I still want my cabinet. I'm pointing that way because I have a cabinet <laughs> there. <laughs> so, yeah. I, I need to have the sound coming at me, mm -hmm. you know? I can't have it like in ears only. It's like, it becomes too sterile for me. I, I need to have the. I, like the Germans say, the balls and the boost. Yeah, yeah. I get what you're saying, man, because on, on my last tour, my whole career has been working on tube amps. And when they told us they wanted to go digital, digital, I was against it at first. I think because I was, I think I was afraid a little bit of having to learn an entirely new system. It's like sure. tube amps are what I know. It's, There's that, yeah. You know, reliable. <clears throat> um, but once we started using digital it was kind of a game changer for the way we did things. And 10 years ago, when the first like Kempers and Fractals and stuff were coming out, you could hear the difference, like no problem. Now with the technology, it's it's pretty indistinguishable, especially in a live setting. Um, but th the thing I liked being a tech was that when all the guys switched to digital, they weren't particular about having cabinets on stage, so they went in ears with everything. Dead quiet stage except for the drums, and it helps with tuning acoustic guitars on tight stages and stuff yeah, like yeah, that. But I mean, yeah, in that aspect, it's great. Yeah, but as a musician, you know, when I was putting myself back into a band, I still I was a bass player, and I still think I would have preferred having that bass cabinet on stage for the feel of everything. I mean, at the same time, I mean, today, Johan, our bass player, he only plays with his sand sound. That's it. Mm -hmm. He doesn't bring anything. He only uses the monitor. And I mean, pff, dude, it sounds so good. Yeah. But I mean, it's also, he has like 10 great reasons for making it sounding like that. You <laughs> yeah, know? Like, yeah. But yeah, it's a, uh, he, he's a terrific bass player. And I guess you need to be, to make that work in a sense too, right? Yeah. So, but just this sand sound pedal, it's, they should make his own signature sand sound because... I you know, I don't know why they don't. It's yeah. a, like, listen, make his sand sand signature model. They will sell like, you know. I mean, I probably would be willing to guess. I'm looking around right now because I probably have the same sand sand pedal you're talking about. Yeah. Cause that's what I used for my tone. I used the bass head for the actual power and stuff, but all my tone was from a sand sand. Mm. Like mm. they're great. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, one thing with a, a lot of musicians too, is knowing, knowing what you need. I I've seen a lot of musicians that they think more is more is better. And they come out on the road and they have tons of different shit and like a hundred pedals and all that. And then on the flip side, like you said, you got somebody that just plays bass with a sans amp because that's all they need to have the sound yeah. they want. I mean, if, if you can make that work with that, then then you're like the happiest guy in the world, I guess, mm -hmm. because you know, you can bring all of your gear in a like in a backpack. That's it, you know. Yeah, yeah. 
That's where's awesome. your touring gear? It's here. It's like thanks. Yeah. <laughs> That was the only nice thing about digital was when we did fly dates and we went overseas and stuff. Yeah, yeah sure. It was, yeah. You, you don't have to rely on that backline anymore. And, you know, half the time you get a backline amp from a company, a tube's blown out or something. With yeah. our fly stuff, I mean, I could take it out of the case and be fully ready for a show in 10 minutes because all of our yeah. files are just loaded onto a fractal. Yeah. That, that's the only advantage to me. And I, but I ask you, I mean, I don't know what you said, but for me, it's like when I, when I pick up a guitar and you, and you plug it into an amp and you, you know, take the first tone note and you, then you want to feel it. Right. Yeah. And when I did that with the fractals and the, whatever, ever, all of these campers, uh, it never sounded great to me. Yeah. But at least now the neural stuff in the computer for me sounds like that. It's like, sounds like a guitar. I don't have this high end hiss that sounds digital. It sounds you know, so yeah. and neural neurals taking neural. over. I mean, it was all about Kemper and Fractal recently, but all these bands I'm seeing they're using neural now. I mean, that's like back to orbit culture. I think they recorded their whole entire new EP and album just using neural. Yeah, we did it. We did too. All of the rhythms and everything, but uh, nice. we reamped them, of course. But and they have this floorboard. I can't remember what it's called, but. What they should have done with that one, if I can be critical towards them now, is they should have put all of these artist amps into that pedal that you have on the floor. Then you would have, so because that's what I, that was what I was expecting. I wanted to have the Abasi and all of these clean sounds and the, you know, the, the electric solo guitar sounds that I could fuck with myself and make it my own. But it's none of that. <laughs> why <laughs> put yeah. all that in there you know because they want people to buy the individual expansion packs <laughs> yeah I get, I get that but i mean these uh, that the individual expansion costs like 99 bucks yeah and this costs fucking two thousand yeah. bucks right so yeah. whatever no i get I your think, point for sure yeah if they would have had that in there i, I think they probably will and I mean, of course, there's there might be politics with uh, mixing, you know, Gujira stuff with John Petrucci stuff and whatever, you know, in terms of who's getting paid what. Yeah. But okay, rename them then, you know, and call yeah. them something else. That's right? what Fractal does. All the yeah. pre, all the settings and all the Fractal stuff is right. identical copies of other things <clears throat> that have just been renamed. Like the Ingle Powerball in Fractal, I think, is like oh, what. I can't remember what they called it, but it's something similar. Yeah, I know. It's I know, like yeah, yeah. electric ball or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's, it's still their idea. Idea, you know, it's still yeah. their invention. So I mean, yeah. yeah. Because when that happens, and I can bring this, and have all of my stuff that I worked on here and just load it in there, then yeah, then I'm all for it. And then you can plug that into a preamp of, uh, of the fifty on fifty or whatever is on a festival. Then I'm. Then I'm gonna be happy. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, sorry, you just said festival, and I want to take a quick turn here because I saw with your touring schedule, you guys do have some festivals coming up too, right? Yeah, a few. Yeah, yeah. That's. Uh, I mean, those are always fun for me because that's kind of like a family reunion. You get to see a lot of other yeah, people. That you that's where you meet all of your friends. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but I don't know if you can give this information or if it's even available but do you do you have plans to come over to the states anytime soon yeah i mean right absolutely and of course we all we always have for the last 30 years almost so uh right now we're looking and talking to lots of different agents to be honest uh seeing what we will be doing next but we're aiming for march uh next year nice uh given all of these usual visa problems that we have coming from Europe into America and that is also something that is even more complicated now after p the pandemics but I mean of course it works but it takes a long time so in order to come in March next year you have to sort of have that tour set now which makes it difficult in terms of for the agents to have a tour one year ahead you know it's like it's difficult that's one of the things I've always felt so bad about for artists because I hear stories about artists that come to the U S and they tell me about the visa issues and stuff like that. And I, I just say this to be honest, not like bragging, but it's like, we never have those issues. I always thought it was normal that you could just go tour in any other country. No problem. Just go work, whatever. And then when I started hearing from friends, like even just Canada to the U S for example, I worked, I worked, Big hustle. 
<laughs> I worked for a Canadian band where I was the only American on the crew. And one day we were talking about, you know, stuff like that. And they were all complaining about visas. And I was like, what are you guys talking about? And they're like, our visas that we had to get to come work in the U.S. So it's like, and I kind of just had this blank face. And they're like, do you not need a visa to come tour in Canada? And I was like, no. And they're like, what the fuck? Like, yeah, I, I never realized ridiculous. it was a big deal. I mean, it's, it's, and it's cost so much money. And it, uh, we, uh, the lawyer we have that may, uh, makes these applications for us, he showed us the pile of papers that he has to file in order to prove that we are a professional band every time, even though we just had a visa. It's this much papers. That's insane. I mean, and he has to refile. Can you please look from October last year? <laughs> because we were we were just there. No, you have to fill out the application from the start. That's that's so insane. And it costs man. like I think it's like at least fifteen hundred bucks per person you bring. And if they're crew, it's twice as much. Jeez. So it's no point in bringing crew from Europe if you're not like big. And that's that's uh, one of the points I was trying to tell some people recently because they were like. You know, when I talked about doing the Electric Cowboy Tour, they're like, why don't they just bring their entire crew from Europe? And I was like, well, bands don't make a lot of money when they go overseas to tour. They usually aim for breaking even because for a band from Europe to go to the U.S. or the other way around, it's basically just to get to another area for your fans over there to see you play. Like, you're not making money on that. So that's why a lot of bands will have crew from, you know, the local countries do that is because sure. it's so expensive. Yeah, it's yeah, it's ridiculous. It doesn't it doesn't make sense, you know. Yeah. Uh, and now we've been there so many times and we so we started working up like a, a lot lots of people that we have been working with. So, you know, and now it's getting to the point that we at least can call the guys that have been with us before, you know. So it's uh, yeah. at the same time we also want to have your crew that you work with every day yeah. on all the other stuff right so yeah that's one of but the, it is what it is yeah yeah that's one of the big arguments whenever um whenever we go into canada one of the things that they ask us as, as crew guys is um because in their minds it's you know an american is coming to canada and doing a job that a canadian can do so they always ask us why are you coming and i was like well Yes, there are many other Canadians that can do this job. The thing is, we work for this artist all year long, so we know all the little details. Like, that's what I try and tell people a lot is, you know, people ask, why do bands have specific touring people when there are local people that could do the same thing? It's like, mm. while, while there are people that could do the same thing, you keep that crew guy because they know every little attention to detail to everything that you want. And that's time. That's why usually before these tours, we do production rehearsals. So we get to see all the gear. Sure. Like, yeah. I don't I don't think we're doing production rehearsals when Electric Callboy comes over here. I think it's going to be straight into the first show, and <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to have to learn all their Probably. stuff in one yeah, day. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. And those are always interesting because it's like, I, I like those challenges where I just on the spot. Like, my first gig ever on my last tour that I did was straight into a show day. They fired somebody, they needed somebody, and I took over. So the first day of the show, or the first day for me was a show where I we, we dumped the trailer and I just was like, okay, so I got all of this and I need to figure out exactly <laughs> how, to how make everybody work. wants yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's always fun. I, that's the job some days here, right? Yeah. I mean, if you miss stuff when you have a flying show and all of your gear is lost on an airplane, or, you know, you have to figure it out. Yeah, I've had that happen. <laughs> Yes, yeah. not one time either. It's like, oh yeah, it happens. I I feel like we got cursed by Australia. Every time we came back from Australia, our gear would never make it back on time, and we'd only have basically whatever we carried on and flew with, and then we'd have to rent stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Every time we flew with Air France back in the day, they it was either broken or lost or stolen. Oh. You know, it's like yeah. every time. Yeah, I've I've never. I've been fortunate enough that I've never had anything broken, but wow. I've definitely I've definitely had stuff lost for like a month. Like the airlines just like we don't know where it is, and then one day I just get a call and it's like, oh, it finally made it to the destination like a month later. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Yeah, that's but, awesome. I but mean, yeah, it's great that you haven't had anything that was 
broken. I mean, I think you had so many times where, you know, you, you see the case come out, and then the guitar oh. comes out after it. You know, it's like. Yeah, I've had rage moments where I've been like sitting on the plane while it's boarding, and I'm looking out the window. And you look, yeah, and you can see them <laughs> throwing it. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. You knock on the window, it's like, <laughs> hey! Yeah. And of course, they, you know, they don't care. And, and they're like... <laughs> <laughs> and then they throw the next guitar, yeah, looking at yep, it. You know? Yep, and, it's, and they know, airline people aren't dumb. They, they see a case, they know what's in it, they know it's a guitar, they just don't of care. Course. They just don't care. Yeah. What is this? Yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, especially in a place like Nashville, where there's bands flying out of here every day, they know that if they see an SKB case or a Pelican case, like it's it's band gear, and they still just fucking chuck it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, that sucks so bad. Yeah, uh, yeah. But I mean, I've had plenty of gear damaged on the road, just not flying. I mean, country country festivals in the summer. I mean, we're in like the Midwest in the United States and it's guaranteed every day we're going to get a thunderstorm at some point. Mm -hmm. We've had gear lost to rain and all that stuff, man. I mean, it's just, you know, and that's why bands have insurance on their stuff, you know? Well, yeah, I mean, but it sucks too. I mean, still, if yeah. you, even if you have an insurance and you break a neck of your favorite acoustic guitar, the, there's nothing that's going to be able to replace that anyway, you know, it's like... For sure. I'm gonna be very lucky to have a guitar that feels like it. You know, yeah. and, uh, it's not it's not gonna happen. I've had to especially for acoustic guitars. I think uh, too. Yeah, it's specifically with acoustics. I've had to convince artists that I've worked for to like retire guitars from the road because that's that's something they don't think about because they don't need to. Like they're up there to play. Like I always tell people, the job of a roadie is to make sure that all the person they work for has to worry about is walking on stage and doing a good show. That's it. That's everything. Yeah. And, and I had a country artist that had a, a, an acoustic guitar that they played on stage every day that they got as a gift when they were 12 years old that got them into music. And I've had to be like, you should think about retiring this because if a freak accident happens while we're on yeah. tour and this guitar breaks, that's years and years of memories and sentimental yeah. value that you're going to lose. <sighs> Yeah, so. I mean, I wouldn't bring like a '58 Gibson, what do you call it, <laughs> L2, whatever, on road. It's like, phew. yeah, you'd be surprised. Some people, yeah, some people, well, yeah, well, there are people with money. I get it. <laughs> well, no, it's not even that. It's it's not the money part. It's there are a lot of artists in the states that I've worked for that it's almost a, um, it's almost a sense of showing off. They like other people to see what they have, and they don't think about what's going to happen if it gets damaged on the road. <laughs> Yeah, or stolen. Yeah, oh, Shit. had that happen too, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had a whole bust. When Hannes was in the band, we went to Rome and we played, uh, we were supposed to play the night in Rome, but they broke into our bus and stole everything. Jesus. I mean, everything. He even hadn't paid the first bill on his drum kit at that time, and they stole the full drum kit. That's I mean, All that's, of our guitars and... That's worst nightmare on the road. That's but that happened in our in our rehearsal studio as well, we, uh, like our headquarters. They broke in there and stole <laughs> the computers where we were recording the, not the Escape of the Phoenix, but the the Storm Within album. Uh, so we had to st st restart recording, and it was like. I hate to ask because I don't want to bring up any like bad memories or anything. But did you ever get any of that stuff back? Yeah, we did actually. We oh, had the okay. police call and said we found his video uh, camera. Uh, where where we think it's you on the camera? It was actually me and Vikram on the camera because we were recording stuff, and that's how they connected us with the gear. No so way. We got, we got we got some of it back. Some of it, of course, not. But yeah. At least something. Yeah. Yeah. There is um, in in the states. Uh, I don't know if this is still a thing, but when I was in a band, like in the early mid two thousands, it was very well known that in Detroit, Michigan, there was a ring of people that would steal bus trailers and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And um, so they always told every band that played at a certain venue, they're like, lock everything as much as you can and stuff like that. And that's why I always tell new crew guys on tours, I'm like, lock the bus doors. If, if, sure, if I catch you yeah. not locking it, shit's going to go down. Cause, yeah, and back the trailer up against the wall and yep. all that stuff. Um, Chevelle played at a venue in Detroit once. And when they went on stage, uh, somebody in the band didn't lock the bus. 
somebody stole the whole bus. They literally fired up the bus and drove. They they stole the bus. That's amazing. I like. <laughs> Imagine that guy being the one who didn't lock the door. Oh, dude. And a lot of a lot of young crew guys that I've had on tours, uh, when I've told them to lock the door, they're like, nobody's just going to walk on a tour bus. And I was like, yes, they will. People will. Yeah. Die. I've talked to bands. We had a band on tour with us once that while they were sleeping on their bus, somebody didn't lock it and somebody came on their bus and stole all of their personal shit from the front and back lounge of the bus while they were sleeping in their bunks. Sure. You know? Nobody cares if somebody's walking in the bus because it's, of course, somebody else, right? You know, yeah. from, from the crew. I mean, we, Detroit, we played this, I can't remember the name of the venue, but they when they, they said to us before going on stage, that when you're done with the show, like run into your bus because they had people shot here last week. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you were probably at like, mm, you I might have been at like Harpo's or something. Yeah, probably. No. <laughs> like, <laughs> is is Harpo's the one out by the bridge, by the Ambassador Bridge, towards Canada, or is it? I believe or is it the so. one. Well, that was Saint yeah. Andrews. Saint Andrews. No, Hall. no, Harpo's. That's correct. Harpo's. Because okay. the other one is called Blondies, right? I think. I, yeah. I don't know. It, yep. There, so there's so the clubs there, the like Harpo's, and then uh, Saint Andrews Hall is a big one too. That's actually where Chevelle's bus got stolen from. Oh shit. Um, and um yeah that's one of those there are certain cities in the u.s that most tour managers and production managers know like you know that's that's when you take more care to lock to back the trailer up to you know yeah, yeah. leave the second yeah. you're done and they, it's a leave the second the show is over you leave that and park yep. it elsewhere you know yeah, yeah i mean we had one of the funniest <laughs> one of the funnier stories of just anybody will walk on a bus is um I did a tour years ago that was, it was like a, it was a big tour. It was like seven or eight tour buses. And every morning we'd have bus call, um, uh, after a day off, like at the, in front of the hotels and we're all sitting on the bus and all of a sudden, like eight businessmen in suits and briefcases just walk on the bus and like sit down and act all normal. Like they should be there. And there's like five <laughs> of us crew guys on the bus and we're just like, can we help you? And they're like, no, I was like, um, you're on a private bus right now. And they're like, yeah, we're aware. I was like, no, this is, this is our bus. And they had mistakenly like their law firm or whoever they worked for sent over like a regular commuter bus to pick them up. But they thought that our bus was that bus. So we had to literally argue with these guys and convince them that like they were on a tour bus and not the right one. And like, they refused to leave. Like we had to go get people to like make them leave. It was ridiculous. <laughs> So. Yeah, there's so many stories. I remember Rickard, our keyboard player, we were playing a festival in, in Belgium once and, and he didn't want to join us to the hotel after, you know, he wanted to stay and drink, but the whole damn area was closing. So, you know, we didn't, we didn't, you know, get the logic behind his argument, but I'm going to stay. You guys go ahead. It's like, okay, whatever. Stay, you idiot, you know. And he, <laughs> he had this plan to walk on to... Uh, to Children on Bodom's bus because we toured in the US together with them for like seven weeks or whatever. Yeah. So I'm just going to go over to them. So he walked over there. And he, <laughs> but of course, they had a new crew guy. So when he went into the bus, he's like, get the fuck out. You know? <laughs> Dude. Who the fuck are you? <laughs> you know, I've, get out. I've had and moments like that. They were all that. asleep. So they didn't help him either. So yeah, that was funny. Yeah. And crew guys, crew guys can be very defensive and protective. I mean, that is sure. part of our unspoken or the unspoken part of our job is that not only do we you know take care of the gear and stuff but it's like we we protect our artists and i've had yeah. moments like that where somebody's like been somewhere they shouldn't and i didn't know who they were and i just yeah. went into full-blown defensive mode shit we played vancouver once where they have all of these drug addicts outside of the venue it's i mean it's it's like uh, walking dead yeah and we had i mean we had three or four different people trying to break into the bus while we were there yeah. in the bus we yeah. were in the bus and we're like knocking on the window hey go and they were, and they were like yeah vancouver is insane because that city is like it has um the poorest per capita in population in north america but also the richest 
there's such a division in that uh, city okay. where depending on where you're playing in that city, I know exactly what you're talking about because there are areas of Vancouver that are literally just... Yeah, this is like one street where it's yeah. like crazy. And mm -hmm. you walk out there and it's like, it is walking dead. Yeah, Vancouver is so bad with drugs that they actually started putting um, needle uh yeah. deposit boxes in public so people don't just leave their needles on the street like yeah, that's yeah, yeah. insane um we were but, having the intro go go uh, the, the push play on the intro and you had to stand outside of the venue to get on stage you know and behind us was this guy shooting up in his leg and his friend had an od right beside him so he was laying there shit and i was like is this happening? <laughs> yeah. And we're like, okay, yeah, have a good night, guys. And <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's crazy, man. There are, there are a lot of cities in North America that are having really bad like drug epidemics and stuff like that, and it seems like it's yeah. just getting worse. You know, it's, um, it's sad. Yeah. Don't yeah. do drugs, kids. Do something <laughs> else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's you know, it's crazy, and I've seen a lot of people, you know. Uh, do it on the road too it's like you know I've, i i shared this with you already i got to a certain part in my touring where i just knew for me like i i couldn't do any substances anymore because i was just an animal like so i just stopped and then i watch other people on tour that are like getting like roadies that are getting like hammered during the show and like get yeah. high during the show and i'm like guys you guys are getting paid to per, to be responsible right now like yeah i mean we all, all had those guys oh yeah you know, yeah you have to fire somebody on tour and you know that somebody don't show up at all <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know sound guy never showed up oh, where the hell is he nobody knows you know it's like jeez, jeez. we had what i mean the... that goes for the artists as well so yeah, yeah. i've <laughs> <laughs> I've I've had moments with artists where just they lose track of their day. They don't know what time it is. And it's like, we'll have the intro to our show rolling and the whole band side stage, except for one guitar player, like a guy I'm teching for. And they're like, where the fuck is so-and-so? And I'm like running all over. And finally I run to the bus and he's just like playing video games. I'm like, dude, <laughs> yeah. the show starts in one minute. And he's like, oh shit. <laughs> like, <laughs> We had that with Rick, the guitar, the keyboard player. He was in. We were in uh, Anaheim, and uh, <laughs> and he had a friend in LA. So they were out doing stuff during the day, and and they of course got stuck in LA traffic. And you know, oh. dude, I mean, <laughs> it's ridiculous, so stupid. <laughs> yeah. So we were uh, on our end rearranging the set and thinking of what we could play instead, and you know. And while the intro is on, he runs in to the and we and we're like, we're gonna fucking kill you after the show. <laughs> and it was like, sorry guys, <laughs> tying his shoes. And then it's like, you know, yeah, he, yeah. he literally, literally had ten seconds, or else yeah. he would have sort of missed the, at least the first song. Uh, I mean, dude, those moments, those moments, I think happen more than people like people in the crowd actually <laughs> oh. realize. <laughs> All of these Spinal Tap moments, yeah, absolutely, dude. I, Touring is literally just spinal tap moment after spinal tap moment. I mean, I've had it happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, where, that's what it is. Like, I've had it happen where we do a sound check during the day and all of our gear works fine. And then during the changeover from the opening band to us, all of a sudden something's not working. But the front of house guy cues the intro anyways. And then in my head, I'm like, I have 90 seconds to figure out how to get whatever is not working, working yeah. right now. And then I do with like three seconds left. And it's, those are the funny moments where it's like the crowd's all fired up and ready to go. And little do they know there's like three people backstage that are about to have strokes. Because, Heart attacks. Yes. <laughs> yeah, like, and <laughs> yeah. there's, there's so many, I, in a weird way, I liked those challenges on the road. I liked those intense yeah. moments of like, all right, we're going to see if he can actually do what we're paying him to do. <laughs> You know? yeah. I mean, the worst thing is, and also the, the most fun thing is when it happens during the show. So you get to start the show and not yeah. everything is great. And then the third song, your main amp dies and your second amp dies and everything else sort of yeah. dies yeah. on you. And it's like, okay, <laughs> let's yeah. see what we do now. And then usually those shows become extremely f fun, you know? Yeah. It's just because awesome. you don't expect Why? anything anymore. Yeah. It's like, whatever. I've 
I learned really quickly too that when a mistake, when something malfunctions on the road like that, my brain always went to worst case scenario. So I was like, I'll give you a good example. Um, same thing happened at a show once, like third or fourth song of the set. Uh, all the sound from my lead guitar player's amp just dies. And I'm like, he looks at me, I look at him, and I was like, all right, I'm on it. I go straight to the amp. I look at all the tubes. They're all lit up. Everything's good. I'm like, okay, it's not that. I go to the second amp. Everything's cool. So both of his channels are obviously powered. Um, I go to his pedal board to see if a patch cable came undone or something like that and nothing. And I'm like, what the fuck is going on right now? And we used XLR looms from our amps to the pedal boards. So we had to have those powered SDI boxes for the signal. And what I had learned happened the next day. Well, what I did in the moment was like, sorry, dude, you're just playing on a cable straight out of your amp for the rest of the show. Cause we had no idea what's going on. The next day I realized he accidentally stepped on the tiny little power block for the SDI box and unplugged it that much. Yeah enough that it lost power and didn't power the board yeah so, we done all, all everybody's done that like, but i also did one other thing once i sort of screamed at my tech to, it's like it's not working and he wasn't paying attention we're doing something else at the time you know and he comes out and we can't figure out what the hell is going on. i was like Fuck it, man i'm gonna throw this goddamn guitar in the floor on the floor but then it, then <laughs> after a while I, I still have the guitar on and then ah I didn't raise the volume. <laughs> I've had that happen. <laughs> no, dude. Oh but then it's like, hey, fucking, and then you have to make, uh, you know, make it look like it was his fault. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Dude, I've had that happen so many times uh, with um, uh, with Dustin, the last guy that I teched for. There was a, a song that he would start by himself, electric. And it was a really mellow, like, ballady song. It was just a little bit of distortion on the guitar, a lot of reverb. But I would always hand him guitars with the volume knob down and he knew like it's on. All you got to do is raise the volume when you're ready to play. Yeah, 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 and I yeah. kid you not, once a week, he'd go to start this song and he'd look over at me panicking. And I would, yeah. I would literally just look at him and go like this. And he would be like, oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> like, I know you. You're being an asshole to me. <laughs> yeah, so those those moments happen, man. And it is it is yeah. funny where you say like. My favorite is when when I would work for artists that would actually like laugh it off and just be like, "Yep, that's my bad." Like whatever, you know, shit sure. happens. But I have seen I have seen roadies get a lot of blame for stuff um, because, in a certain sense, I, I, and to be fair, I, I'll gladly be the scapegoat if if something happened during a show and the artist wants to play it off like it was something that happened with the gear behind the scenes, I'll take it. I don't care because the people that are at the concert are there to see the artist. They're not there to see the roadies. Exactly. They, in their mind, they want to know that the artist is as perfect as they're going to be. So if an artist <laughs> yeah. fucks up and blames it on me, I don't give a shit. Whatever. Like, um, As long as you tell the guy afterwards, that, dude, I had to, you know, I, I looked like an ass up there and I, I, I had to make you look like the asshole. You know, it's yeah. like... Uh, as long as you say, if I mean, when you have been working with your crew for a long time, then it's those things are usually not a problem. But then you have had these crew members that never take responsibility. Yeah. You know? They I, expect the amp to work the next day. It didn't work the day before. They didn't check it. Didn't do anything with it. They want the same amount of money in their pocket when they leave yep. the venue, but they don't do their work. You know. I learned, I learned the hard way. I will fully admit, like nobody ever wants to admit that they made a mistake and I get it. But I, I learned over my career that it's, it's way easier and better for everybody that if I made a mistake, I was just honest and told the artist that I made the mistake. Like I've, um, I've had times where I handed somebody a guitar and then when I got back to my guitar world, I forgot to hit the pedal switcher and activate that guitar. And I hit it like five seconds later. And then after the show, they say, hey, what happened in that one little moment? It's easier for me to just be like, I just totally forgot to hit it rather than make up some elaborate story about why it didn't. Sure. Work. Yeah. Why make up a story? Yeah. I mean, it's like, that's what make you an asshole. Yeah. When you, when you don't, you know, just, dude, I'm sorry. That's it. Yeah. And I feel like the artist will trust me more overall if I just tell them that rather than make shit up, you know? So, yeah. And mistakes happen, man. I mean, live music is never perfect. It was That's why it's cool. Yeah, it was it was way more rare 
that I would ever have a show where everything like worked right than something not working. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, but dude, this, this was fun. I loved how we just went here on a tangent and just shared stories and stuff. This, yeah, I love absolutely. this. I love this man. And it's, it's, yeah, love dude, it. we've been going at it for, what is it? Two hours? Almost, almost, almost two hours. And I do, wow. I, I do want to get you going here because you've given us a lot of your time and I appreciate it. But before we do that, yeah. I would like to remind everybody that's listening right now that Evergrey's new album, um, A Heartless Portrait, The Orphean Testament, is coming out on May 20th, 2022. First full record with Napalm Records. Right. Pre-orders are available. If anybody's watching on YouTube, I'll throw links in the description and all of that good stuff. But for you, I always like to ask the artist, with a new album coming out, whether it's financial or not, whether it's buying merch or just sharing the music, what would you recommend is the best way that somebody could help support Evergrey right now on a new album? I would say also this goes for every artist right now after the, the pandemics now, go out and watch all the artists you can. If you're sort of curious about a band, don't go listen to them on Spotify. Go out and watch them if they pass your city because we need all the support we can get and you need all this music coming straight into your ears and hearts again. And, uh, and yeah, I say that for all of us because people have also been conveniently sort of laid back during these times mm -hmm. forgot what live music brings you, you know? So get out there, ce celebrate life and music and beer. That's my sort of last go. words. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. I love it, man. And yeah, there is, there's something special about that live music atmosphere. I know for me, when I go see it. live music, it sometimes makes me feel differently about the band and the music that I'm hearing, man. So absolutely, absolutely. And it's also most of the time it's like, I didn't expect this. I mm -hmm. mean, you can, you can have bands that you don't love, but when you watch them live, you get a certain amount of respect for them. And then one of the songs that you watch is like, wow, I really love that song, but I didn't love all of the other stuff. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. which is great. That's what music is, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, dude, I cannot thank you enough for giving oh, me this much you. time Thanks and talking. And dude, I just, I'm excited for the new album. I'm excited for you to get back out on the road. And, uh, you know, whether I make it to Europe or you guys make it over here, I just can't wait to actually meet you and see you guys play live. Let's do both. You come over here, yeah. we go over there. You know, all for that sure. good stuff. <laughs> awesome, man. Well, thank you again. Have a wonderful rest of your day. I hope your finger starts feeling better soon. Soon. Yeah. It's getting work. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. But seriously, uh, be safe. I'm sure I'll talk to you soon. And thank you once again for giving me the time to do this. Thanks for having me. All right. Take care, man. Thank you. I love this guy, man. That was fantastic. You know, as I said in the intro, the last time I had Tom on the channel, I was still new to doing this and I was kind of reserved. But this time was just so loose, man. Like, of course, we talked about the music and his gear and stuff like that. But we had a lot of laughs and just some random conversation. And that's the whole goal of this podcast. I want this to be like a conversation you'd overhear at a bar or something like that. And I think we really achieved that in this one, man. He's just a really cool down to earth guy. It was great to talk to him. And just as a reminder to everybody watching and listening, Evergrey's brand new album, A Heartless Portrait, The Orphean Testament, is coming out on May 20th, 2022 from Napalm Records. And as another reminder to everybody watching or listening, there are different formats of this podcast available. You can watch the video form on YouTube. You can listen to the audio on Spotify, Google, Apple, and pretty much anywhere else that podcasts are available. Now, if you want to keep up with me away from the podcast or YouTube, you can check me out on a lot of different social media outlets. I'm not on everything, but I'm on most Twitter, Instagram, even TikTok, even though I barely use it. But my handle on everything is at tank the tech. We also have a discord server that a lot of us hang out on. I'll have links in the description of the video if you're watching on YouTube. And I'm also streaming on Twitch from time to time. And you can find me at twitch.tv slash tank the tech. We check out a lot of new music. Sometimes I play video games and sometimes when I'm bored and really just don't feel like doing anything, I just sit and talk to you guys and it's super fun, man. But we have a lot coming up on this podcast. I have so many guests lined up at this point and it's just mind blowing to me and very humbling that this has taken off as quickly as it has. 
But for episode eight, the next episode of this podcast, we're going to have Chris Harms from Lord of the Lost. I could not be more excited for that. They have a new EP coming out as well. And I'm super excited to bring you not only that conversation, but a lot of the other ones that we do have planned. So just as a reminder, before we wrap this up, you can watch these on YouTube. You can listen on Spotify, Google, Apple, all of that stuff. Feel free to share it around, tell your friends about it, because I can't wait for this to grow even more than it already has. So special thanks to you guys for watching and listening. Another special thanks to Tom England for joining us. My name's Tank. This has been another episode of the Back Lounge Podcast, and I'll be back very soon for another one.